we saw how it is worked, we saw his wonderful showroom. Then we split up for some uh, lunch time and some free time in Volterra. From there we headed winding down. It is an isolated town and we were heading out towards the Mediterranean. We were heading out towards the A Autostrada number 12 where we were going to head up following the route of the Aurelia, the Roman road number one, up past Pisa. We talked about the wartime because the ports, the coast was the area that was so badly uh, damaged. That was where they were targeting, where the ships were, any way they could damage the enemy, then that's what they were doing. And we talked about this this war paper I have that the monument then was really made from this information on the war about the conservation and preservation of works of art during the war. We then passed Pisa. We passed it. <laughs> we saw it in the distance and waved to it. Those magnificent monuments in the Campo dei Miracoli We'd already heard in the wallpaper that the Campo Santo had been very badly damaged and had caught fire. But the other monuments, wonderfully, were not damaged. Because once the Allies, once 1943 came and the armistice was signed, you know, there were many, many buildings that had to be bombed by the Allies because the Germans were using them as bases or as fortresses. And as we've all heard of Monte Cassino, that was the main one, a great tragic loss during the war. But so much has been rebuilt now, so we are going, we are going forward. Luca, we arrived. First thing we saw were the walls, three kilometers, two and a half miles of walls around Luca, off at the Porta Santa Maria, trundled into town. That noise I love of us rolling into town. Checked into the. Hotel La Luna, then boxes on, a little bit of an orientation so that you knew what was happening, where you were, restaurants, we went into San Michele in Foro, the Forum, which is underneath the Roman Forum, under the Church of San Michele, this magnificent church with its beautiful pillars. Pisan Lucchese Romanesque, unique, only two in the world. They're both in Lucca, the Duomo and San Michele. Then we went into the square where Puccini's house was, which is now a museum that his family owned. We saw him sitting there, the bronze statue. Then round into what I call the French square, Napoleone. We, said, we heard, we talked about um, Elisa Bonaparte, who ruled Luca for a period of time, and they liked her. She was a good ruler and did some really good things for the town. Out of the French square with its plain trees into a little square, the Piazza San Giovanni Battista, where we saw the venue for the Puccini concerts that are performed every night virtually every night of the year, in fact, by young, lovely, young, talented musicians. Back to the hotel, a welcome drink, a free evening. The next morning, we met up with Carlo, our Lucchese guide, it's his city, and he took us on a walk of the city and particularly as I always ask the guides I love them to show us the wall because the wall is so important to those people who live inside it, the wall and outside the wall because they use it every day to go to work one way or the other they're using those walls and we saw the areas under the bastions where the soldiers would sleep down there it was safe but the wall was never actually used to defend the city because by that stage, gunpowder, ammunition, we're talking about 16th and 17th century, that wall was built. But thank goodness it was because it made a park for a very stone city. 
so they have a beautiful parkland on the top of it. We walked some of that wall. Then we said our goodbyes to Carlo, having also had a look at the magnificent mosaic, the Byzantine style mosaic on the front of San Frediano, this beautiful Romanesque church. We quickly got ourselves organized back to the bus, out into the Compito Hills, the Compito in the Lucchese Hills, the Colle Lucchese. And we there met at the Frantoio La Visona, we met Angelo Bartelena and his daughter-in-law who had been preparing our lunch. And there we sat and met another man with such a passion. This Frantoio, which is owned by about 110, a society of 110 olive growers who are mostly retired, but who bought it, reconstructed it, restored it, and now produce olive oil for themselves there, and also to sell, to keep the whole, it's not a business, it's a passion, to keep it going. And it's only local people who go there and buy the oil, that's what keeps it going. And we heard all about extra virgin olive oil, cold press, the top of the range of olive oils, the only thing they make there. 0.02% of acidity, acidity being the most important thing for olive oil. You don't want it to be rancid with too much acidity. And then we got to try it, to taste it, and then to have lunch with it. A little glass of wine, of course. And then we headed back down through the Compito, back to Luca. And I think a few of you walked the walls, a couple of you rode the walls on the bicycle. Free afternoon, time to look at the lovely shops of uh, Luca on the Via Filungo, where all the shops used to be silk shops and now they're all Benetton and Intimissima, and, but also still quite a number of small shops, family businesses. Evening free also, next morning, we're up earlier than usual because we had a big day ahead of us. We were heading for, first of all, Carrara, where we met the lovely gorgeous Sara de Carrara, who took us up the, the mountain into the Apuan Alps. We'd swap buses into a smaller bus and headed up on that winding road up towards those quarries. We went to the quarry of Fantiscriti, and there we went into the museum of Walter Danese, the gorgeous man who, I know him well, lovely, lovely man. I always used to have a coffee with a grappa with him when I went up there. But now he's in his 90s and it's the family who are continuing the business as so often is the case in Italy. And he created this museum and that house, the quarryman's house, the quarryman's wooden hut as they called them. And Sarah took you through and showed you how the quarry was and now is quarried. From there we came, wound our way back down, we dropped Sarah off, got back into our bus also and we were heading back up onto the European road number 80 which follows that Aurelia. We headed up passing Lake Massachucoli where uh, Giacomo Puccini had his villa and where he and his wife have their, their buried there. And there is a theatre now, the Puccini Theatre. The Festival of Puccini is every July and August on the lake, which was his dream. Carried on up, talked a little bit about Michelangelo, how he went up into those quarries and chose his marble, then had it shipped down to his studio in Florence, and then later, after the horrible Julius II, summonsed him to Rome. He had to have it shipped further down to Rome. And 
we saw all the quarries with the different coloured marbles because we talked about how Turkey and Greece and other countries send in their marble to be uh, cut and treated at these we headed off having seen the wonderful museum up at the top we headed back down we headed up I'm, I'm jumping back sorry we did see the quarries before we got to Carrara and then we headed on up we were leaving Tuscany and we were going to Liguria we were heading for by some miracle we were managing to take a boat because throughout this entire tour we have changed the weather most days and our boat was running we got to Porto Venere we went round La Spezia around the Bay of La Spezia we saw the Italian warships the ferries that all go from La Spezia right round that entire bay to Porto Venere for me the loveliest town on the whole of that Ligurian run the Ligurian Sea we had time for lunch there and then we had a boat booked at 10 minutes to 3. We were all on it. Timekeeping has been impeccable. And we headed along the Ligurian coast, seeing the five lands. Rio Maggiore, Manarola, Cornelia up on the cliff, Vernazza, and then the last stop was our stop. We were getting off at Monte Rosso. We had a stop there for about an hour whilst I got the tickets for the train. And then along from the old part of Monte Rosso into the newer part to the railway station. And we had a six minute journey with a 10 minute delay <laughs> to Levanto. We arrived at the hotel, Daniela, our host, was there waiting for us with a very welcome glass of wine after a busy day. And we talked a little bit about the Cinque Terre and the possibilities for the following day. But having seen it from the sea, what a wonderful way to see it. So we had our meeting, got all changed a little bit, down for our dinner, which in our manual, our guide manual, our Rick Bible as we call it, it says Levanto Feast. So then we, Carlo had been preparing the meal all day for us. Have a look ahead. You can see the snow on the top of the Alps. The Alps are ahead of us now. And we had this wonderful meal that um, even other groups, not doing the village tour, not staying in the Primavera, come to Carlo and have that meal. It's quite a famous meal within the company. And he changes it a bit each time too. We had our dinner, our last dinner with Mario, because um, of course today he leaves us at the Bussola Hotel when we get to Le Corta. So then we had a free day, a completely free day the next day. Some of you followed me, a few of you followed me to Manarola. We did the walk of the vineyards there, which was delightful and no rain, which had been forecast, so that was a dream. Uh, we did meet a lot of lollipop people, however, coming out of every crevice imaginable in Manarola, which was a little bit disappointing, but with so many paths closed in the Cinque Terre, more people are in the towns, of course. You all did whatever you did. I know some of you went to Bonasola walking, some cycling, combing the beach for glass just generally relaxing and uh, all of you seem to enjoy Levanto which I'm delighted because I think it's a great great stop many more choices than actually staying on the Cinque Terre especially if there's a train strike which is not unheard of up there and then you're really stranded this morning we left said goodbye to Daniela Carlo was not there he was at his restaurant in Monte Rosso and we have headed up along the European road number 80 which runs into France and then into Spain from Italy 
but we were only going as far as just the environs of um, Genova. We passed Genova and then we took a right up towards Alexandria and now we're heading north. We had a comfort stop. We're heading up towards, as you can see, we're starting to see some of the places. Gravalona is one of the towns up towards where we are going. And then we're going to be arriving in Le Corta. We usually arrive there at 12. We'll probably get there about 12.40, something like that. Perfect timing. And hopefully the rooms will be ready. Uh, they usually are. And this area that we've been driving through now, this um, Lombardy Plain, this is an area where they grow the rice. The rice paddies are all around. That's the main rice growing area, five different types of rice. Of course, not um, native to Italy. It was the sailors who brought that back from the east, of course. Also the noodles from China, all of these things. I don't know what the Italians ate before other people arrived because it was also tomatoes and potatoes and everything came from your fine country. So um, I'm not sure what they were having. Bread, I think. <laughs> bread and wine. Well, it's not so bad. It's not so bad if you can get nice bread, not so much that cardboard type bread that we had in uh, Umbria and we have in my region too with no salt because of the salt taxes. So when we get to um, Orta, we're checking into Hotel La Bussola. It means the compass, La Bussola. And we'll check in to the rooms. I'll give you a time just within half an hour of checking in because it'll be nice for us to get down. It's just such a beautiful day. Get down to the lake. We'll have a bit of time for a snack lunch, I suggest, because we're having a big meal this evening. But we will start our meal this evening. We'll start it at seven. So we're starting our meal a bit earlier this evening. And uh, we'll see the lake. I'm going to explain a little bit down there. It's just beautiful this lake and then we're going to take a taxi boat our own boat and we're going to go out onto the lake and over to the island of San Giulio the town is called Orta San Giulio and the island is called San Giulio and at San Giulio we'll go out as I told you it's called the island of silence <coughs> I wish but there is also on this island there is a church, it's a mausoleum dedicated to San Giulio. San Giulio was a saint of the early Celtic saints from the 3rd and 4th centuries like St. Patrick and St. Mungo and saints like that. And San Giulio was actually Greek and he came here to Orta and there's a story associated with him very similar to St. Patrick. That he came up and he said uh, to the locals, I'm going out to the island. And they said, oh, no, 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 you can't go out to the island. It's, there's monsters on the island. Nobody goes to the island. So he said, oh, well, I'm going to the island. Don't, don't be fearful. And this was one of his miracles, of course. He went out to the island and he, <laughs> this amazing depiction of him, of him in the church dedicated to him. He looks as if he's on one of those kind of, you know, there's these new surfboards with the paddles people use. They're fashionable at the moment. Well, he's on one of those heading out to the island to expel the monsters from the island, which of course he did. And that is why he became the saint when he died. They built a small sort of paleo-Christian temple, an early Christian temple, and then they built the church. And over the years, it's a wonderful church for us because it's a culmination of everything we've seen through the tour in our different individual churches. I think people usually love it because I always think, oh, nobody's going to want to see a church again. But usually they love it. We just pop in and have a quick look and uh, then we walk the walk of silence and then turn around. For those who'd like to, you don't have to. Sometimes people don't want to go out to the island. If you don't want to, it's fine. Um, because we walk the island and then we turn around and walk back and we read all the, the meditative sayings that the nuns have created that are just on being, how to be. That's my goal in life, how to be. 
just to be in each moment, especially as you get older. Enjoy each moment, I think, is very important. And welcome back. I'm going to treat you to a gelato because you've just been a joy. Thank you very much. You have been a joy. And then set you free for a little bit of time. And then we're going to meet up. Let's meet up actually at 10 minutes to 7. And then we're at the restaurant at 7. And we're going to have a, the restaurant is the Venus. You'll see it when we go down there this afternoon. And we have a lovely room with the windows open or closed depending on the temperature overlooking the island. It's just gorgeous, right on the lakeside.